Now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for this year's summit, our very own University of North Dakota president, Mark Kennedy. Uh, Mark was named the 12th president of the University of North Dakota by the State Board of Higher Education on March 15, 2016. Mark is talking about months and days on the job and, you know, the experiences he's already learned. Uh, he's a Minnesota native and the third generation of his family to live in North Dakota. Uh, Mark came to UND from George Washington University in Washington, D.C., where since 2012, he was director of the Graduate School of Political Management and professor. His teaching and research addresses issues of how organizations can best engage governments and societies around the world. Kennedy is the founder of the Economic Club of Minnesota and a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. He previously served as treasurer of today's Macy's and was a U.S. representative from 2001 to 2007 and presidential trade advisor under both Presidents Bush and Obama. Please give Mark Kennedy a very warm UND students welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Dale. Regular, regular. Thank you. Thank you, Dale. It's an honor to be giving the Morrison Lecture. There's probably no one that better represents leadership than Dale Morrison. He continues to do a wonderful job providing that for our Center of Innovation and elsewhere in the university. I'm here to talk to you about leading in the age of activism. I've orchestrated this presentation just for you, reinforced exclusively with my own photos, <laughs> to shed light on the fact that today the pivotal leadership skill is to be able to see through the disguise that shields the view of powerful actors from the view of business leaders. That disguise is that business strategy today views those organizations with no stake in a company's success as stakeholders. And today's leaders must know how to distinguish those without a stake, but a powerful ability to shape their future opportunities and risks, and know how to deal with them uniquely. Take Greenpeace and Keystone Pipeline. The only stake that Greenpeace wants in Keystone Pipeline is a stake through their heart. And yet they can still shape whether or not that pipeline happens and where it happens. So they need to engage with Greenpeace, but in a completely different way. If you look at true stakeholders, just as shareholders are dependent on the success of engaging effectively with stakeholders, true stakeholders depend on the success of the company that the shareholders own. Take employees. Employees may want a higher salary, but they're not going to get a higher salary or better benefits from a company unless that company exists. Similarly with customers, they may want a better price-value relationship with what they're getting, but they're not going to get it unless the company is there to provide that. A supplier may want to engage in with a company, want to get a better terms, but only if the company is there to give them the better terms, and they can only push so far before they go to another supplier. Similarly with communities that may want more taxes and employment. But again, if they don't have that company there, they're not going to be able to get those. It's completely different for what I call shapeholders. If you think of the shapeholders, because they don't care whether you are alive or not, they have a greater flexibility, just like this lady participating in yoga. They got a much wider range of motion of actions that they can take against your company. And because of that, they can be like the lady in the bottom end of the picture and just you know, give the company uh, the finger. So if you want to have one description of what a shapeholder is like relative to a stakeholder, this is it. Because of that greater flexibility and the more actions they can do, they have more ability to do you harm or good. You need to engage them very uniquely and they're important to engage. They, without a stake, still have the ability to shape your future. 
And so if you think of what I call the four main classifications of shape holders that shape the market environment for both shareholders and stakeholders, it also applies to those that are not businesses, those that might be a government entity, a nonprofit, a university, because they all have a mission, but our mission is shaped by people outside of this university. Just take the legislature and University of North Dakota as an example. If you don't learn how to engage these high voltage forces, it can be very challenging for you. Politicians are the first classification of shapeholders. And if you think about it, uh, perhaps President-elect Trump wasn't that worried about the impact on Boeing when he did the tweet criticizing as to how much it was costing for the new Air Force One, but it clearly had an effect on Boeing. If you look at regulators, not effectively engaging regulators resulted in AT&T having to pay a $6 billion breakup fee because they didn't get approval for buying T-Mobile. If you think about media, New York Times came out with a story saying that Walmart was not behaving exactly the way they should be in Mexico. And even though as the years have passed, that appears to be overblown, it still cost Walmart a half a billion dollars with eight executives leaving the company tied to this. If you look at activists, activists went after the Girl Scouts. Rainforest Action Network went after the Girl Scouts, uh, accusing them of having their source of palm oil uh, causing harm to the environment and the rainforest. So if the Girl Scouts aren't immune to this type of action, no one is. There are those that view business as a force for ill in the world that would have you believe that they are the heavyweights in Washington. But I can tell you, having been in the C-suite of one of America's 100 largest companies, having been a congressman, uh, and not just engaging in the US, but engaging around the world, helping Pillsbury to buy and expand haagen and engaging with diplomats around the world, one of the biggest surprises for me was that rather than business's voice being like the roar of a tiger, it was more akin to the meow of a kitten. It's not because business isn't big and strong and powerful, it is. But often when they're dealing with society, they're too often reactive, combative. And as a result, they end up paying taxes uh, coming and going here in America, the highest corporate taxes in the industrialized world. They have layers upon layers of regulation stacked on them that makes it more challenging for them to do their business. And we've gone from the world of the invisible hand of Adam Smith guiding the economy to more and more in this days of activism, it's as if uh, the business environment is best described by this photo, that if your business gets even close to 30 kilometers an hour, that the hand of government is gonna reach down from the sky and help you slow down. Now, most businesses, when they counter this, they just want a way out and putting out the fire. And they say, these politicians, these activists, these reporters, they just don't understand me. And that's true, but most business leaders don't understand politicians or reporters or activists themselves. So usually they're ships passing in the night and too often colliding in the night. When I was in Congress, one of my uh, constituents said, you know, Mark, I don't want you focusing on things that are gonna raise the price of corn or wheat or soybeans by pennies a share. I want you focusing on the left side of the decimal point on those that'll increase the price by dollars a share. And when you think about business, dollars a share view is dealing with these shape holders. Most business opportunities are well plowed. There's a number of different people going after every opportunity. It's a very competitive environment. The opportunity to improve your operating skills, your logistics skills, your systems, are being invested in by millions and billions of dollars by corporations, but so is everybody else. And as a result, they only really result incrementally in pennies a share of benefit. But if you look at the tunnel vision that most businesses have by not recognizing what's outside of the market, you'll find that most of them when it comes to engaging the non-market or shape holders, they're like what my daughters describe my fashion sense, clueless. And so as a result, they miss these opportunities. If you think about it, for example, Tesla, whose main focus coming into business and today is on addressing the concerns of the non-market, of shape holders, of addressing environmental concerns, 
and with that focus, they are now a greater market value than Ford. On the flip side, in the same industry, VW sort of ignored the intent of regulations and tried to circumvent it, and as a result, they lost $26 billion in market value in two days. That's why I maintain learning how to engage shapeholders is the left side of the decimal point. If you take the long-term view of how you engage in leading businesses, the best opportunities to increase value is to learn how to engage shapeholders in a win-win situation. That's why I've created seven steps to effective shapeholder success. The first three steps tell you how to be prepared for shapeholder engagement. That begins with aligning yourself towards a purpose that benefits you and your business and society. It includes anticipating what could happen to you from them, what their concerns are. It includes assessing whether or not those concerns are legitimate or not, whether you can have an upside or not. And then, depending on that, you have four different action steps you can take. We'll go through each briefly. Beginning with align. If you think about it, you need to have what you're doing in your business operations align with the commitments that you're making to society. And it needs to benefit society and your bottom line. Take Nike. They have put out a purpose for being promoting physical activity. One of the biggest health issues we face today is obesity. Best way of dealing with that is get off the couch and be physically active. So Nike is helping society by being a promoting physical activity. On the flip side, when you're doing that physical activity, you're more likely or not wearing a Nike shoe or a Nike clothing, so it helps Nike as well. Anheuser-Busch, AB InBev, their purpose is clean water. They need clean water to make beer. So if they're in Mozambique and they're using all the clean water there is available to make beer, that's not going to go down that well with the local citizens. So their focus is clean water, which benefits society and benefits them. And it wouldn't make a lot of sense to have Nike and Anheuser-Busch swap purposes. Each does their own purpose best. The second thing you need to do is anticipate. Because in the age of social media, they can come after you just like that. And when that happens, you need to have expected the unexpected and be prepared to respond immediately. That means you need to understand that, like as Mattel found, you could wake up one morning and have a banner hanging over your headquarters as with a picture of a Ken doll saying, Barbie, it's over. I don't date girls that kill rainforests. And when you think about where that came from, it wasn't anything Mattel did. It wasn't anything Mattel's supplier of the packaging did. It was the supplier's supplier that they got the pulp from that they were going after. So you need to anticipate not just what you're doing, but what are your suppliers and what are your supplier's suppliers doing to be prepared. You need to figure out what cannons are facing your direction towards your industry, towards your company, and look right up the barrel of those cannons to figure out what might be coming at you. Engaging with those shapeholders, those activists in your industry, and knowing what they're thinking and what they're wanting. Because if you don't have a positive story to tell, and you aren't telling it every day, you could wake up one morning like Nike and find out that you're being painted as the poster child for child labor. Everybody around the world still knows the story today, even though it happened decades ago. On the flip side, if you look at Toyota's Prius, they convinced California to allow them to use the Prius with just a single driver in a high occupancy vehicle lane. Clearly, that helped California advance their concerns of more responsible transportation system, but clearly, it benefited Toyota. What I'd like to have you think about today is that when you're talking about Tesla and VW, Nike and Toyota, their stumbles or benefits had nothing to do with the market. They had everything to do with the non-market and how they engage shapeholders, which is why this is such an important leadership skill for today's leaders to have. We need to make sure we engage that. When it comes to the market, having a very narrow focus is a good thing. You can find a niche market and you can be very profitable doing that. But when it comes to the non-market, you need a much broader view in order to engage. We also find that we are products of our own environment, where we came from. We're like a submarine, a submarine surrounded by water. We're surrounded by our experiences. 
where we went to school, where we grew up, what our parents did, what we studied, who our friends are, what activities we're involved in. Those activities shape how we view the world. But just as a submarine has a periscope that goes and gets a 360 degree view around it so it doesn't bump into anything and it can go the direction it wants, we too need to cultivate a 360 degree environment. That means we need to make sure that we're understanding not just the business view, not just the political view here in this country, but around the world, because increasingly global impacts are affecting today's businesses. That's why I encourage, for example, that you read something like the Wall Street Journal, which I view as the voice of the intelligent right, but also view and read regularly the New York Times, which I view as the choice of the intelligent left. And there's so few people that deliberately go out and get these multiple points of views to be able to broaden their view. If you do this, it'll be very powerful in your career and your life. But similarly, recognize that there's a world outside us. So get an international perspective like The Economist. As I've said here before, I start every day by reading these three magazines and newspapers and more, and you will find it'll have a powerful impact in your life if you do the same. You'll find that when they come at you, that a New York minute is 59 seconds too slow. You can't, when a social media comes after you, say, okay, we'll gather the executives this afternoon, we'll figure out what our response is. You need to be able to respond, and you need to be able to respond like that. Then we need to assess when we find this coming at us. Is this request legitimate or not? Can we win or not? Sometimes they are judging it based on moral grounds black and white. It's very difficult. We could have a whole lecture on how you judge whether it's legitimate or not in that regard. But also you need to understand the policy implications. Is this policy they're asking for legitimate or not? And the real key is can you win or not, whether or not it's legitimate. This requires you to stack up the benefits and the costs to both you and to the shape holder. The benefits that they get are different than you would normally think about in an accounting sense. They view it as a benefit if they get you to change your behavior, if they get a law passed, if they do something that allows them to do fundraising. And their ability, their cost of identifying and marshalling the people coming at you is becoming lower and lower each day as technology empowers them. You take, for example, when Shell decided not to drill in the Arctic. They didn't do that because of any activist concern. They just found that finding oil was more expensive than it was worth to them. But even so, this allowed people like Sierra Club to claim victory and raise money off that. So understanding the economics of these types of organizations is critical to assessing it properly. When we come then through the next step, I've created what I call a shapeholders decision matrix based on what your assessment phase has said. Is it legitimate or not? Is there an upside or not? If you look at each of those, advance, it's legitimate, there's an upside. An example of this would be Siemens that funds training for engineers around the world because they're not going to be able to sell their complicated equipment to Chad if Chad doesn't have smart people that can run it. And if they invest in schools in Chad that's going to help the, um, the students that come out and have an employable degree, it's going to help the schools be better, it's going to help the country have a more capable workforce, clearly benefits the society, but it's also going to help Siemens, because then they can go to the Chad government or who is ever running their power plants and sell them stuff. Clearly a win-win advancing common interest. The next is avert. You have something that's a legitimate concern, but it's really not going to help you, uh, but I need to address it anyway, and I need to avert worse things from happening. You take the soda companies. The soda companies are constantly at risk at having the obesity issue laid at their doorstep. So they want to figure out, how can I avert this worst thing from happening? And what they've done is they've all gotten together, Pepsi, Coke, Dr. Pepper, Snapple, and they've all agreed as an industry that they are going to, on individual servings, list the amount of calories. They're saying their defense is that it's individual responsibility and they're going to empower individuals with this information. Nobody's requiring them to do this, but they're doing it, and if the legislators felt they needed to do something, this is the path they could require and have taken action. Sometimes you face an illegitimate request that it's just not worth you going and fighting over, uh, or you're not going to win. 
Uh, my favorite example is the case of milk in Switzerland. Anybody who's read the book Heidi knows that the Swiss think that their milk is better than everybody else's milk. We could have a long, complicated uh, discovery of whether that's true or not, but McDonald's has decided it's just not worth doing it. Everybody knows, of course, that McDonald's is Switzerland. And they're at least going to get all the milk that they sell in Switzerland from Switzerland. The big challenge comes in when an organi organization needs to assemble to win. When they have an issue that they view, view as illegitimate, and it's so essential to their business that they have to take the time to fight, this is where it's most difficult. And here's where I have another matrix as to how you assemble. Let's go through a couple of these quickly. If you look at what and where, whenever you're in a battle with public, it's not a question of who gets the answer right, it's who wins the battle for the question. Those who establish the question prevail. If you look at the issue of those that make movies and music, uh, I know no students in this room have ever taken a movie or music that they didn't pay for, but that's a great concern to these providers. And it's particularly concerning in that foreign websites are enabling uh, others from taking them and illegally distributing them without them getting any royalties. So they decided that their question they were going to advance is, should US companies assist foreign companies in stealing US properties? That's their question. That's their what. And they, their where, where are you going to ask that question, was the US Congress. They had strong backers in both the House and the Senate. They had it pass a Senate committee. It was on its way to pass in the House and the Senate, was expected to do so, when all of a sudden, new media came forward thinking that they had a different question. And new media's question was, do you want to let the federal government black out your internet access? And instead of going to Congress to ask this question, they went to internet users and dealt with public opinion. And the reaction was thousands, indeed millions of, of people emailing their congressmen. And that was sparked in great part by on a particular day, most of these website providers just blacked out their, their internets with this message to propel that action. This law that was meant to be passed right away is not passed today and will never be passed because the new media had a better question and a better where they were asking it than the old media. Then you need to figure out who. Who's going to tell that message for you? Who's in the coalition of the other side? Who do you need to have in your coalition? In this regard, I, I think this is the best picture you have of burning your mind about coalitions. Uh, I need cookies. I got milk. Milk and cookies are very different from one another. One is hard and crunchy, one is liquidy. But they go very well together. And those people in your coalition that are most different from you, that look less like you, that act less like you, that think less like you, extend your reach as a coalition more. So you want to make sure you're cultivating those relationships with activist groups and others. But not all activists are the same. If you look at it, I divide activist groups into two. What I call carrot activist groups uh, that want to entice business into better behavior. And even though this lion looks ferocious and, and might be scary, in reality, uh, WWF, World Wildlife Federation, is one of those carrot activist groups that work regularly with businesses to move in a more productive be behavior. On the flip side, there's what I call stick activist group. They just feel the best way to encourage businesses is just beat them over the head. So even though this young lady looks nice and friendly, she's really working for Greenpeace, which would be classifying as one of those thick activist groups. You want to bring as many carrot activist groups into your coalition as possible that you can maintain a legitimate back and forth mutual benefit relationship from. Because when the TARC, when they come after you, you need to make sure that you have a good team around you. So that when you find yourself up against the barracks, that you're more likely to have friends and allies come in that can help provide some support for you. Then how? How do you do this? Uh, you need to very target your message very carefully. Uh, too often, people think it's just going and talking to your elected official. But you know what's even more powerful is if you bring your employees, your customers, your suppliers in their district in to talk to them because they'll pay more attention to them. And you need to be able to engage with those that are your stakeholders. 
This is where your stakeholders can be very powerful in engaging shapeholders. You need to be able to engage them directly and get to them immediately so when some PD is coming after you, you can inform them, put it right in their hands in their smartphone right away. And if you don't know how to use one of those, just ask your son-in-law and he'll show you how. <laughs> so I hope I've opened up a new dimension for you. I hope you as future business leaders understand that you need to pay attention to more than just what's happening in the boardroom. You need to pay attention to what's happening out on the streets, what's happening in the capitals, what's happening on TV, what are people agitating about. You need to understand that those are your issues too. You need to look for opportunities where instead of being painted as a demon, you have an ability to be painted as somebody that's doing positive things for society. And with that, you will find that you're going to be far more profitable in the long term. We face very serious headwinds. We're at a pivot point, but I believe we can avoid the crash if we just learn how to balance all of these interests, the shareholders, the stakeholders, and the shapeholders, and tap that inner urge within all of us to be that superhero and dive in and create a better world. And if we gather around our table all of those different interests that have mutual concerns with us, we, I'm confident, can leave a better world for all of our children. Thank you much. Thank you.